We've now developed two equivalent ways of illustrating the firm's short-run profit maximizing decision. We started with a short-run production function that has a slope of marginal product of labor and found a tangency with the profit line that has a slope of wage divided by price. By setting those two slopes equal to each other at the tangency, we derived our profit maximizing condition that the marginal revenue product of labor has to be equal to the wage. We then graph the marginal revenue product of labor curve, which derives its shape from the short run production function, and showed that where the wage is equal to the marginal revenue product of labor is where the profit maximizing choice of how much labor to hire happens. Now, if we use the same wage and the same output price in the two pictures, we should get exactly the same answer. The profit maximizing quantity of labor should be the same and that results in some output level that gives us the profit maximizing production plan. Now we're going to use these two pictures to derive the firm's output supply and labor demand curves. And we do that in exactly the same way as we did for consumers when we derived consumer demand curves. We started with a consumer diagram, found an optimal bundle for a given price, and then changed the price to see what happens to that optimal bundle. And that allowed us to trace out the consumer's demand curve. So here we're going to begin with a new graph. In that new graph, we're going to put price on the horizontal axis and we're going to keep output on the vertical axis just as we had over here. We already have one point for this picture. We know that at the original price, let's say this green price, we're going to produce this much output if we maximize profit. We can now ask, well, what happens if price increases? If price increases, then price in this denominator is going up, which means the fraction is decreasing. The slope of the profit lines is becoming shallower. If the slopes of the profit lines are becoming shallower, that means the tangency is going to have to lie on a shallower portion of the short-run production function, somewhere up here. And we reach a new profit maximizing level of output. So at this higher price, we'll end up producing more. What if price falls? Well, if price falls, then price increases in the denominator here, which means the fraction, I'm sorry, price decreases in the denominator here, which means the fraction increases in value, which means the slope is getting steeper. When the slope gets steeper, we'll get a tangency on the steeper portion, and eventually the slope will get so steep that we'll get a profit line that has a tangency and that intersects at the origin. And when that happens, we know that that means that profit is equal to zero. So at some price, profit's gonna be zero even if we profit maximize. We'll call that our break-even price. If the price fell any more, the slope of the profit line would become even steeper. A tangency would happen here, but the intersection with the intercept would happen at a negative quantity, which we know means that the firm would be making negative profit. Firms are, are not going to produce if they make negative profit. So if price falls below the break-even price, output is going to be zero. But once we get to the break-even price, we can maximize profit, figure out the optimal quantity, and trace out how much output we're going to supply for different prices. This then is a function. It's a function that tells us for different prices, holding wages fixed at whatever the current wage level is, how much output we're going to produce. So this is a supply function, which is not exactly the same thing as a supply curve, just like a demand curve wasn't exactly the same thing as a demand function. 
but the relationship between the supply function and the supply curve is exactly the same as the relationship between the demand function and the demand curve. For supply curve, we want to put price on the vertical axis and output on the horizontal axis. That's exactly the inverse of what we have here. All the information we need for the supply curve is already contained in this picture. We just have to flip the axes. So what happens is that we have a break-even price. We know below that break-even price we're going to produce zero. So that's this part when we invert it. At the break-even price we'll start producing the blue quantity. As the price rises to the green price we'll produce the green quantity from over here. And as it increases the magenta price we'll produce the magenta quantity from over here. So we can then trace out the supply curve and get output supply. Now all along that curve we're holding wage fixed. As wage changes the supply curve is going to shift. Okay so what about the demand curve? Well we can derive the demand curve from this picture and we already have one point of the demand curve. At this wage, the marginal of revenue product of labor curve tells us this is how much labor we're going to hire. The reason for that is that for the early workers, we are actually losing money. They're earning us less in additional revenue than what they're costing us in terms of the wage. But we make that up for the remainder of the workers that we hire who are earning a greater additional amount for us in revenue than what they're costing us. So we have this little negative area that's the sum of all the losses from the early workers, but then this big positive area that's the sum of all the gains from the later workers we hire. And as long as that area is bigger than this, we're making a positive profit. What happens if wage goes up? Well, if wage goes up, we again look to the marginal revenue product of labor curve to determine how much labor we're going to hire. But now that negative area has gotten bigger and that positive area has gotten smaller. And eventually wage is going to rise so high that that negative area is exactly equal to that positive area at which point we have reached our break-even wage. If the wage goes above that then that positive area becomes smaller than the negative area and we would be making losses by producing. So we're not going to produce, we're not going to hire workers if wage goes above the break-even wage. But once wage hits the break-even wage, the marginal revenue product of labor curve tells us how much labor to hire. So redrawing that over here, we have labor on the horizontal axis. We can now put the wage on the vertical axis. We have this marginal revenue product of labor curve. And the first thing we do is find the break-even wage, the wage that makes these losses exactly equal to these gains. Then we know everything above that wage will result in no workers being hired. But once the, we hit the break-even wage, we're going to hire workers along this marginal revenue product of labor curve. Now let's just erase the parts we don't need. And we have our labor demand curve. Now again, on that labor demand curve, we're varying wage, and now we're holding price fixed. As price changes, labor demand will change in very intuitive ways. Now notice that that labor demand curve slopes down and the output supply curve slopes up. What's the fundamental reason for that? Well, the fundamental reason is that the marginal revenue product of labor curve slopes down. That's what gives us this downward slope here. And this slopes down because of the law of diminishing marginal product. The law of diminishing marginal product also implies that we have to have this concave shape up here for the short-run production function. That concave shape 
is another expression of diminishing marginal product of labor. And that concave shape is why this supply curve slopes up. As prices increase, we get shallower and shallower profit lines, so they have to be tangent at shallower and shallower parts of the short-run production function. And those happen up here because we have this concave shape. So the law of diminishing marginal product of labor is ultimately responsible for both the downward slope of the labor demand curve and the upward slope of the output supply curve in our short-run model.